Okay, welcome everyone to our forum tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, before we begin, I would like to pass it over to our Executive Vice President of Programs and Services, Hector Garcia, for opening remarks. Hector. Uh, thank you, Ashley. And uh, uh, this is uh, our Immune Deficiency uh, Foundation Forum for IG Therapy and uh, Finding the Right Fit. Uh, this is actually our 21st uh, virtual forum. Uh, we have now provided information and education to close to 1,000 members, 2,000 members of our PI community in 49 states and a few different countries. And uh, if you're all trying to guess, it's, it's Hawaii. So if you know, uh, if you have anybody uh, that you know in Hawaii that supports our community, you can give them a call. And uh, if they join our next forum, uh, all our states uh, would have been represented uh, so far. Um, um, I've enjoyed so far the opportunity of engaging uh, with you through our forums and continue to look forward uh, with our team uh, to develop new programming uh, for you know, our community. Uh, to our return attendees, welcome back. Uh, I think uh, we got a few people here with uh, a perfect attendance record, uh, Deborah and Dana, and uh, um, I'm assuming that uh, about you know, 20, 25% usually of our uh, crowd are uh, repeat uh, attendees. So um, we'll try to uh, form for you a frequent flyer, uh, frequent attendant club uh, rather soon. Um, uh, for our new participants, welcome. Uh, it's my sincere hope that you will enjoy tonight's forum and that you will join us again as we continue to serve you through our programs and services. And um, I was going to say, you know, on behalf of our president and uh, CEO, John Boyle, and uh, on our board of trustees, I want to thank you for your participation and support of IDF. Um, um, we might have uh, John uh, attending tonight. So, uh, John, if you're somewhere there and you want to say hello, uh, you're more than welcome to. Hello. Um, I, I will remain uh, uh, quite silent here because uh, tonight is an infusion night for me and it's also a late night dinner uh, eating night for me. Um, so I am here because uh, some of our, our, our folks uh, out west I think are experiencing fire tornadoes uh, and some of our folks up north are experiencing uh, uh, intermittent uh, uh, issues with uh, internet uh, due to uh, probably the cold northern winds. But more than anything, uh, the issue is uh, at IDF, we are a team. So uh, if we see that uh, there might be some issues with, uh, uh, with some folks uh, who are part of the team, we always try to make sure that we are backups to one another. So uh, I am here. I will, uh, by and large, uh, be off screen because I don't think anyone here wants to see me eating or infusing. Uh, but thank you all for coming. And thanks to all of my team members who hopefully will not have issues of freezing up or losing power or any of those good things. But that's the nice thing about having a, um, uh, a, a, an office that is not bound by geography. So Hector, thank you. Everyone else, thank you. And you're about to see my cat, yes, as she walks across the screen. That's the other reason I'm gonna stay well, on the screen. So thank we, you. We gotta make sure your cat doesn't run away with your dinner, so. Oh, no, 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 well, she, I think that's why she's here. Thank you all. <laughs> All right. So, uh, thank you, John. Thank you so much. And as you can see, we're, you know, one, uh, one big team uh, that will continue, you know, to provide you with, you know, information uh, that's timely as uh, your, your safety and well-being is uh, our priority. Um, at this time, I would like to thank our sponsors uh, for this event. Uh, it's the partnerships and contributions that IDF is able to bring you programming so that uh, you're always you know, better informed. Uh, this includes our core services uh, leaders, uh, CSL Bering, Griffles and Takeda, our core services supporter, Octopharma, our core services sustainer, Horizon Therapeutics, our core services contributor, uh, Lydian Biosciences and ADMA Biologics, our national sustainer, Acredo, and our national patrons, Diplomat Specialty Infusion, Kedrion Biopharma, CVS Specialty, Corum CVS Specialty Infusion Services, Coru Medical Systems, and uh, Kava Fusion. Uh, I also want to, you know, uh, kind of bring up the fact that many of our sponsors have plasma donation centers 
uh, across the country. And I encourage you, you know, to uh, visit the website or we're going to provide you with a link uh, where you can get information in terms of locations and times as to how to uh, be able to uh, support, you know, uh, plasma collections uh, throughout the country. Um, so I want to thank you again for being here with us tonight. And uh, that's about it for me. I'm going to uh, actually uh, turn it over uh, to Ashley Ferreira, uh, who will be your host uh, for tonight's forum. Ashley, take it. Thank you so much, Hector. And again, thank you to everyone for joining us today. As Hector said, my name is Ashley Ferreira and I will be your host for this evening. Uh, John kind of called it. I'm actually located out in the West Coast and we are having thunderstorms and severe heat and power outages. So hopefully that won't happen uh, during the event. But if it does, you can send any of your questions to IDEA Forms and IDEA Forms will be able to help you. And another, just a quick disclaimer, the information presented during the forum today is not medical advice, nor is it intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Rather, we're here for you to help provide you with information and resources that are very important for you taking advantage of your health. Um, as Hector has mentioned in the past, IDF's mission um, is to be here for you, to uh, foster a community that's empowered by advocacy, education, and research. Uh, as you can see from our constituent values and promises, such as trust, compassion, integrity, our forums are created for you. We want you to be able to trust us. We're here to offer you our compassion. We're using innovation where we can to provide you with these forums as often as possible. We know that the world has been changing so much lately, and we want to make sure that we are here for you whenever we can be. So we are going to go ahead and pass it then to Ellen DiGirolamo from CSL Bearing for a quick word. Hi, can everyone hear me? <laughs> yes, we can. Okay, great. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I'm Ellen DiGirolamo with CSL Bearing. I'm the Boston um, Area Manager for Immunology, and I represent um, both Hyzentra and Privigen. Um, I just want to thank the IDF for um, hosting these events virtually and keeping everything going um, during this difficult time, and thank you for including us. Um, I'm looking forward to tonight's event and the speaker and just sharing information about our products um, in the breakout sessions. And just again, hats off to IDF for keeping these events going. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in person um, at future events, you know, down the line. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen. Uh, at this time, I would like to invite Mark Nelson for a quick word from Acredo. Let's see if he's able to come on, Mark. I clicked every button on the computer, my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> we are so thankful to be here and to learn from you guys. This is Mark Nelson with Acredo, and, and we just are very thank thankful to be part of this community and to learn from you guys during this event. Um, so thank you so much for having us, and, and we look forward to uh, learning throughout this event. Thank you, Mark. We appreciate your words. And now, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Wasserman to um, speak. Uh, Dr. Richard Wasserman is board certified by the American Board of Allergy and Immunology and the American Board of Pediatrics. He treats individuals of all ages diagnosed with PI at Allergy Partners of North Texas and also serves as managing partner. Please welcome Dr. Wasserman. Well, <clears throat> thank you for, excuse, excuse me. Mm. <clears throat> Sorry about that, folks. A little bit of a dry throat to start. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and for the opportunity uh, to participate in this important program. Uh, I have been uh, a supporter of the IDF and participant in its programs for decades. And uh, I really think you all do great work and I'm happy to be part of it. Okay, so these are my commercial involvements. Uh, as you can see, I'm very heavily conflicted, uh, having relationships with most of the plasma processing companies, uh, but nothing about this evening's uh, talk will be product specific. <clears throat> so the goal for the next uh, half hour will be to uh, explain 
uh, what IgG and IgG replacement therapy are and to the degree that you can do that yourself um, to help you understand the benefits and burdens of the available modes of IgG administration and to discuss the need for IgG therapy and the most appropriate method for delivering it uh, with your doctor. So, <clears throat> you know, the um, information that we get from the manufacturers uh, focuses on the different characteristics of uh, the different products that they have. But in fact, <clears throat> most of those characteristics are not very important to patients. What is important to patients is <clears throat> Uh, for those people doing subcutaneous immunoglobulin, whether they have a 10% or a 20% solution. Uh, but most of the rest of the factors don't really impact the therapy uh, for most individuals. However, there are some exceptions to that. So <clears throat> for uh, Patients who have kidney disease, diabetes, or high blood pressure, uh, there are certain uh, extra ingredients, the uh, inner ingredients in the immunoglobulin products, uh, and carbohydrate is used by some products to help stabilize the IgG, and that creates a problem for people who have these risk factors, and so, I try hard to avoid using uh, carbohydrate containing products in people uh, with those problems because they're at increased risk for kidney injury uh, from their infusions. Um, people who have heart disease are often on low sodium diets and uh, some products have sodium in them as a stabilizer. And so for people who have high blood pressure or heart disease, uh, I will uh, choose a product that uh, has no sodium or at worst uh, just traces of sodium. Um, isosmolar is a, a fancy word for how much stuff there is in the liquid uh, <clears throat> that is the sum total of the IgG and the stabilizers. And it should be very similar to the total amount of stuff that is in the liquid part of blood or plasma. And that's isosmolar, and that reduces the stress of having to equilibrate um, liquids <clears throat> in, the, in the body after the infusion. And uh, again, for people who have uh, uh, heart disease or a history of myocardial infarction, heart attack, or stroke, uh, <clears throat> you would like to use uh, smaller infusion volumes uh, so there's less fluid load uh, on the heart. Uh, viscosity relates to how molasses-like the product is. Is it thick or thin and runny? And there are certain conditions that add abnormal IgG to the blood, and those people are at risk for problems relating to excess viscosity. And so in those patients, again, we use a lower concentration product that is isosmolar and has no sodium. So um, IVIG first became available late in 1981. Um, for the 10 to 20 years prior to that, the routine mode of administration in North America and most of Europe was intramuscular. IM gamma globulin is really painful. Uh, and because of that pain, the dose was limited to 100 milligrams per kilogram per month. So that's um, about an ounce and a half per pound of body weight. Uh, and so the very first product that came out used the same dosing <clears throat> that was used for the IM. Uh, but the second product used a dose that was twice as high because unlike IM gamma globulin, uh, there's almost no limit to the amount of IV IG that you can give. And uh, a few years later, 
Hi, I'm Roifman from Sick Children's Hospital in Toronto. Uh, did a study and showed that um, the pulmonary outcomes, that is infections of the chest, uh, were less of a problem and, and people did better if their IgG level uh, just before their infusion was at least 500 or more. Um, at this time, uh, package insert recommendations for the different products range in dose from 300 to 800 um, milligrams per kilogram uh, per month. And that's uh, not a, the differences are not a reflection of any differences in the products, but just uh, differences in how the studies were performed. Uh, but it's important to understand, and, and there are many doctors, particularly those who are not immunology specialists, who feel bound by the package insert. And I'll show you in a few minutes why uh, that may not be a good idea for an individual patient, but every package insert has a statement that says the dose should be adjusted to the clinical, clinical outcome. And so even though the maximum recommended dose for a given product might be six or seven or 800 milligram per kilogram per month, uh, your physician can adjust that dose to a higher dose if they need to, to get the desired clinical outcome. So <clears throat> this is uh, a slide that uh, along the bottom uh, shows <clears throat> the IVJ, uh, IVIG dose uh, per month, and uh, along the left-hand side shows the level that is achieved. And uh, what this slide says is that um, for every 120 milligram, uh, for every 100 milligrams per kilogram per month, you increase the dose you increase the level by 121. So not surprisingly, the more you give, the higher your level. Why is that important? This is from the same study, and what this shows is that the, uh, for every 100 uh, that your blood level goes up, your risk of pneumonia goes down by 27%. So studies dating back to the early 80s show that within very broad limits, the more you give of immunoglobulin replacement, the better you do. And this excellent uh, study that analyzed 17 clinical trials uh, provided really good evidence in support of that. The more you give, the better you do, the higher your level, the, few, the less likely you are to get pneumonia. So all of those studies looked at the averages for dose and for blood level in, individual, in, in groups of patients. And um, what I'd like to walk you through here is uh, look at the top panel, panel A. Along the bottom are the months of the year, uh, and along the left-hand side is the IgG level. Now, the gray bar in the middle is the level that the insurance company said was the right level to, to go for. And the markings, that is the S and the P that are shown there, are episodes of sinusitis and pneumonia. And what you can see is that when this patient's level was above that dashed line, he didn't get sick. And when that level fell below the dashed line, he had sinusitis and pneumonia. And <clears throat> so that level is referred to as that indiv individual's a biological trough level. Now, if you look in the lower left-hand corner, it's exactly the same story. Uh, when the levels were above the dashed line, patient did well. 
And when they fell below the dash line, the patient got sick with pneumonia or ear infection. But the reason I'm showing two graphs that show the same thing is that the dash line in the lower left is at 700, and the dash line in the upper right is at 900. And the point here is that each individual patient has their own proper biological trough. And what that says is that the right dose of gamma globulin for a given individual patient is the dose that keeps them well. And you can't arbitrarily say that, well, <clears throat> if this patient has a level of six or 700, uh, that should keep them well, and if they're getting sick, there must be some other reason. Uh, within very broad limits, again, the higher the dose, the higher the level, the lower the risk of infection, and that is a very individual thing. I have patients who need a dose of 500 per kilo per month, and other patients who need a dose of 1,200 per kilo per month whatever the right dose is for them is the dose that keeps them well. Okay, now <clears throat> there are three modes of administration of immunoglobulin. I think most everybody on the call is familiar with IV, IG administration or IVIG. Um, typically these infusions are given every three to four weeks although they can be given more frequently. Uh, you have to have an IV started. Uh, most people need to have somebody else start the IV. In my 40 years of immunology practice, I have had only one patient who has started their own IVs, although some of my colleagues say that all of their patients start their own IVs must be something in the water in Washington State that lets those people uh, do that. Uh, <clears throat> the location of where the infusion is given, that is the location of care, uh, can be at home uh, with a, a specialty pharmacy nurse who comes to the home at uh, what is hopefully a mutually convenient time uh, to start the IV and get things going. Uh, or it can be administered in the doctor's office if your uh, treating physician has an infusion suite in their office, or many people go to an infusion center uh, that could be a freestanding building run by a medical group or a specialty pharmacy, or in some regions, a hospital. It used to be common for people to go into the hospital to get their IVIG infusions but that has become less and less common because it's probably the most expensive way uh, to get your uh, immunoglobulin replacement. Now, bioavailability is just a term for how much of what you give is actually there to help the patient. So with IV, everything that you put in the vein goes in the circulation and travels around the body and goes wherever it's needed. So uh, IVIG is 100% bioavailable. Uh, normally an IV is done uh, just with one site uh, per month, one IV location, hopefully achieved with a single stick. Uh, and again, that's usually given every three or four weeks. Um, Systemic adverse events, and those are things like headache, malaise, muscle aches, fatigue, sometimes sinus tenderness or cough or fever. Uh, <clears throat> those problems are more frequent with IVIG than with any other method for giving immunoglobulin. Uh, local adverse events, that is, problems at the surface where the IV is started are quite rare. Now, <clears throat> the uh, major alternative to IVIG is SCIG, or subcutaneous immunoglobulin. 
And uh, this is a picture on the right of a person getting their uh, SDIG in four sites. Now the subcutaneous space, that is the space underneath the surface of the skin, was not designed to accept fluid. So in, in subcutaneous immunoglobulin infusions, the immunoglobulin pushes aside uh, the material underneath the skin uh, and makes room for itself. Uh, <clears throat> and a way, to, um, a way to think about that is uh, the substance under the skin is very much like jello in a bowl. And if you're going to put some fluid in there, you need to take a spoon and push it aside to make room for the fluid in, in that bowl of jello. Uh, the big advantage of sub-Q is that there's no need for an IV. Uh, virtually all uh, patients who do sub-Q self-administer or administer with the help of a parent, family member, uh, or friend. Uh, therefore, a nurse or other healthcare provider is rarely needed uh, for people doing sub-Q. Um, the bioavailability of sub-Q is 63%. Uh, what that means is that of the total amount of immunoglobulin you put under the skin, 63% of that is detectable in the bloodstream. Uh, and because of that, uh, the FDA recommends that when transitioning from IV to sub-Q, that there be a dose adjustment uh, to account for this, uh, this decreased bioavailability. And some experienced immunologists do that. In the United States and Europe, um, most immunologists do not. Uh, but non-immunologists often follow the, patient, the package insert. Um, the reason uh, for not following that dose adjustment recommendation is, again, what I said earlier, which is the right dose that keeps the patient well. So I'll be adjusting the dose all the time based on the clinical outcome, and I don't need to make a, a calculation to accomplish that. Um, depending upon how often um, sub-Q is given, uh, and it's normally given uh, most commonly once a week, uh, but can be given as infrequently as every other week, there are some people who, um, either because of side effect problems or just personal preference, uh, do it every day. And uh, that's called daily push. And if anyone's interested in that, uh, ask me a question about it. I'll be happy to expand on that. So depending upon how many sites you use, uh, that will influence the number of needle sticks you have per month. If you recall, I started the very first slide of the presentation uh, mentioning that the characteristic of an immunoglobulin product that is most important to patients is people who are doing sub-Q, whether they have a 10% sub-Q product or a 20% sub-Q product. There are at this time two 10% products and several 20% products uh, and a 16.5% product. Uh, the more concentrated the sub-Q product is, the less volume is required to deliver the same dose. And so there can be fewer sites per infusion and fewer needle sticks if you use a higher concentration product. Um, systemic adverse events, that is again, headache, muscle aches, uh, malaise, uh, kind of flu-like symptoms, uh, those are much less frequent with sub-Q than with IVIG. Um, about 12 to 15 percent as often as um, with IV. <clears throat> now, uh, local uh, adverse events are common. So you're 
pushing the subcutaneous material out of the way, and you're putting the immunoglobulin just below the skin. And uh, so this can be associated with uh, redness or swelling, uh, sometimes itch, sometimes discomfort. Um, almost everybody has that one of those, one or more of those problems at some time. Uh, but for reasons that are really not understood, the severity and frequency of those problems decrease as you continue to use sub-Q immunoglobulin. So if you look at the first two infusions, almost everybody has a problem at the first or second infusion. Uh, but if you look at six or eight weeks, the frequency of problems has gone way, way down. And many, most people have few to no problems. Okay, now the last modality is called enzyme facilitated subcutaneous Ig. And uh, I'd like to explain that to you so you have a sense of what's going on here. Um, I'd like you to imagine a skyscraper under construction, uh, all beams and girders and nothing on the inside. And that is what the structural proteins of your skin are like. And now pack that skyscraper with jello. Uh, and that's what your subcutaneous space looks like. These beams and girders filled with jello. If you take a hose and try to put water into this building of jello, the water will bounce right off of the solid jello. But uh, shift my metaphor for a minute, and you all know that if you have a bowl of jello and you take a fork and you stir it up vigorously, you break the jello into little pieces and fluid can go around that. So, what happens in this kind of procedure is an enzyme uh, re reversibly. Um, breaks up some of the subcutaneous uh, filler material and allows for very teeny micro channels that facilitate the administration of large amounts of fluid sub-Q. So in the standard sub-Q that I talked about on the previous slide, the highest recommended dose per site is two ounces. Uh, but it is possible to put 20 ounces in a single site when you use the enzyme pretreatment. So the obvious advantage of that is that you can put in a large dose very infrequently. And infusions with facilitated are done every two to four weeks, most commonly every three or four weeks. There's no need for an IV. Um, most people self-administer or administer with the help of a friend or family member. Uh, it is mostly done at home, although um, it is permitted to be done in an office or infusion center. <clears throat> the bioavailability is almost 100%, uh, so no dose adjustment is recommended. Uh, most people actually use two sites when they do their infusions. And the systemic adverse events are substantially less than with IV, but a little bit more than they are with conventional sub-Q. And the rate of local adverse events, that is itch, discomfort, swelling, and redness, is roughly comparable to standard sub-Q. So I have been working with uh, Takeda for well over a year to uh, help develop um, what's called a feature ranking tool uh, that is designed to help you folks uh, evaluate uh, what is the best modality of therapy for you. And uh, this tool graphically represents an individual patient's choices. So it's a little confusing, but the way, the way this ranking tool works is there's a set of questions, about a dozen questions, 
uh, that you fill out and they ask things like, which would you rather have, shorter infusions or getting your treatment at an infusion center? Um, which would you prefer, um, more frequent infusions or to be given at home? Uh, and by answering these questions and then performing some statistical calculations, uh, you can develop a profile that helps you identify uh, what is most important to you. And for this sample patient, for instance, the most important thing was that the infusion be given at home by themselves or a family member. Next to that was that it was given in an hour or less. After that, uh, that it was given only once a week, uh, and so on. And, you know, the ranking will depend on how the individual person answers uh, their questions. And this tool is not quite available yet. You're getting a preview, um, but it will be launched in the next several months and will be available to all physicians and all patients uh, with immunodeficiency who are thinking about starting immunoglobulin therapy or who want help in deciding uh, whether to transition from one modality to another. So I thought you might be interested in uh, my view of uh, how I decide on how I treat a patient. And this is for a new patient. So I've categorized the patient into, their, into different categories based on what's going on with them. So if a patient is actively sick and in the hospital, I will give their infusion IV and I'll give a big dose because I want to get a lot of immunoglobulin on board to help them with their infection. Um, if they're actively ill but not in the hospital, I will also give them uh, a, my kind of routine starting dose, which is five to 600 per kilo per month. Uh, and I will give that IV again to achieve a high level quickly. Uh, and I will be. Um, pretty strong. I'm a big believer uh, that my responsibility is to teach people what they need to know to make good decisions, not to make decisions for them. But in those situations, when a person is actively ill, I will lean pretty hard uh, on the recommendations that I show you here because I think it's important to get over the acute illness. For those people who are not acutely ill, um, I recommend what's referred to as a shared decision-making process. And in that, the physician and the patient talk about the various characteristics of the different methods of treatment and what is important to the patient. And uh, that's where that tool comes in to help. You know, what is your life circumstance? Um, is it hard for you to travel three hours to an infusion center? Um, are you uncomfortable with the notion of having a nurse come into your house? Um, do you have arthritis so that you don't have the physical capability to do your own infusion? So uh, shared decision making is an effort to take into account all of the issues other in addition to the primary illness that impact a patient's life and uh, and work with the doctor together uh, to come up with the best recommendation. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, some examples would be uh, a patient who has a lot of side effects from their treatment and needs to be monitored uh, every time during their treatment. It's probably gonna be better off with IV treatment in an infusion center or doctor's office. Um, people who have IV problems, who are difficult IV sticks, um, or uh, people who would like to self-administer and do so infrequently, 
uh, facilitated subcutaneous uh, would be the best for them. And uh, for people who are uh, concerned about systemic side effects, uh, the way to minimize the risk of systemic side effects is to use conventional subcutaneous therapy. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, as you think about the different approaches, it's also, I think, useful to think about how doctors approach uh, side effects of therapy. And as many as 25% of IVIG recipients experience some systemic side effect. And from the time IVIG was introduced in 1981 until the middle, mid 2000 aughts, the approach to side effects was to give extra fluid before the treatment, um, to administer at a slower rate, to go from product to product looking for the one that works best for the individual. And I'll just make an aside that it is not possible to predict which product is going to be best for a given person. Uh, there are product patient pairs. So I may do best with product A, someone else may do best with product B and you can't reliably predict what is gonna work the best with the fewest side effects until you've had some experience with a given product. Uh, we can give medications before, like aspirin, ibuprofen, Aleve, uh, give antihistamines like Benadryl or Atarax, uh, or give steroids like prednisone. Those pre-treatments have never been studied in a study, so there's actually no data that says that they work, but they're a very common practice to try and uh, prevent side effects. Um, could we go back to, yeah. Um, in 2005, the first product uh, specifically developed for subcutaneous use uh, came on the market in the United States and Europe. And um, after that, my view was that you shouldn't mess around with all kinds of manipulations if you're having side effects from IV because you're likely to have such a, a better experience side effect wise with sub Q. Uh, the best thing to do is uh, to switch to sub Q. Uh, after 2014, when the enzyme facilitated product was released, uh, that adds into the mix uh, because both enzyme facilitated sub Q and conventional sub Q. Uh, have substantially fewer systemic side effects than IV. Uh, however, sub-Q is not without its problems. Um, if there are problems with uh, infusion site reactions, uh, the most common reason for that is that the subcutaneous needle is too short. Uh, another problem that occurs is when you're starting the infusion, uh, many people have a habit of putting the liquid through the pump tubing uh, and then seeing a droplet of the liquid on the outside of the needle. Turns out when you do that, that causes a lot of pain. So uh, it's important to clean the needle tip before inserting it. If there are problems with local uh, reactions, uh, I apply heat and I may change to a different product. Um, if there are systemic adverse events from sub-Q, and they do happen, even though they're less frequent uh, than with IV, they certainly do happen. Uh, the first thing I would try to do is uh, change products. And if that doesn't work, I would give lower doses more frequently. And I have had patients who have done best when they do their infusions every day um, with a very small amount. Um, an issue from the physician's point of view and really from the patient's point of view is adherence. That is, um, when you're doing your sub-Q infusions at home on your own, it's all the control is up to you. 
And so whether you stick with your plan, your treatment plan or not, is a big issue for doctors, especially those who have been used to using IV in the office and giving up that control to the patient can be uh, hard. Um, among the reasons that people don't do their infusions as often as they're supposed to is that there are too many of them. I've mentioned doing extra infusions with lower doses for people who have side effects, but most people do just fine and, uh, and they find that they're able to stick with the plan if they do their infusion every other week rather than every week. Uh, <clears throat> we can also choose to use a higher concentration product, a 20% product rather than a 10% product uh, to allow us to do every other week infusions without having to do too many sites at the same time. And if that becomes a significant problem, you can change to the facilitated enzyme facilitated sub Q, which is only given every three or four weeks. So I thought it might be helpful to hear some recommendations uh, about what uh, I uh, immunoglobulin recipients ought to expect. Uh, and the, so I see my patients every three months. Um, there are experienced immunologists who say everybody who is sick enough to get gamma globulin is sick enough to be seen once a month. And there are other experienced immunologists who say, um, you know, these are responsible adults or parents. And unless they're having problems uh, that they bring to my attention, I only need to see them once a year. That's a style issue. Uh, that you could take up with your physician. Um, at the time of the visit, uh, there should be a conversation about infection frequency and antibiotic use. Um, most of our patients treat us uh, like a kind of primary care physician and always call us when they're sick, but that's not always true, or they may go to a minor emergency room or something like that, or their primary care may be uh, treating some or all of their infections. And keeping track of how often antibiotics are used is an important measure of how effective the treatment is. And then uh, a lot of people get the dwindles at the end of their cycle. Uh, three to five days before their next treatment is due, they kind of lose energy and lose focus and don't feel as good. And those people need a dose increase or to have their infusions more frequently. And that's a question that we ask at every visit. It's also important for the healthcare team to ask about the burden of care and how well the treatment is tolerated. And I mention the healthcare team because nurses and other support staff are really important here. Um, many, uh, many of you out there, uh, for one reason or another, don't feel comfortable giving the doctor bad news. Uh, you know, we've been doing this for a while, we can take it, but uh, for those of you who don't feel comfortable giving the doctor the bad news, many of you have no trouble burdening the nurse and giving her all the bad news and expecting her to pass it on to the doctor. And that's not ideal, but it's okay as long as you tell somebody uh, that you're having technical problems with your infusion or you're having problems with side effects. Uh, those are the kinds of things that uh, you have a right to expect will be addressed by your treating physician. And then you should also be aware that most of the gamma globulin companies have programs that uh, are, uh, provide support uh, from a financial point of view uh, and often a psychological point of view with uh, patient support groups or uh, shared experience, uh, kind of uh, not counselors, but uh, anonymous friends uh, to help you through the rough spots. And you should take advantage of those resources. So, uh, 
I, I think you all understand that IgG therapy is life-saving. That's why you're here tonight, that there are several options available uh, for how you get it, whether it's IV, sub-Q, or facilitated sub-Q. There are a number of different products that are equal in effectiveness, but they are not identical. Um, you can vary the frequency of your treatments uh, and the dose per infusion and how quickly they're given and all of those things impact on side effects. And the keys to success in IG therapy is for you to understand your therapy, for you to know what to expect, know what your treatment options are, and keep your physician informed. And at this point, I'll be happy to take any questions. I think that's the last slide. So uh, take advantage of all of the resources of the IDF. They have great written materials and, uh, and you can call them and talk to them about your problems and they will help you. But also uh, the immunoglobulin manufacturers all have websites for their products with videos and if you want to see a video of how a particular method of giving therapy is done, you can go to their websites. Of course, they're going to be touting their product, uh, but I think you're experienced enough to be able to look at the important stuff and ignore the promotion. And now I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Wasserman. We appreciate your presentation. And I'm so excited that you're excited to get to our Q&A. But before we go in, I did want to remind everyone, if you have questions, send them to IDF forums in the chat. And before we jump in there, I am actually going to invite Griffles for a quick word from our sponsor to give you opportunity to send in a few more questions. Uh, Tanner Worth, it is all yours. Hey guys, thank you again so much for allowing us to uh, continue this partnership. Um, it's, it's beyond impressive what the IDF has done to pivot during these unique times uh, as we continue to navigate uh, the global pandemic. We're honored to be here and happy to be a partner. Thank you, Dr. Wasserman, for a fantastic talk. Uh, I think you mentioned everything I was going to mention in my breakout room, so I, I guess we could just kind of wrap up here. But we appreciate the time and thank you all, and we look forward to speaking with you soon. Thank you so much, Tanner. Next, I would like to invite Eric Pluckhorn from Octopharma for a quick word. Hi, thanks. I'm Eric Pluckhorn, one of the product directors and the marketing team for the IG franchise at Octopharma. And I'm joined tonight with Joanna Maltese, who's one of our clinical nurse educators. And uh, on behalf of everybody at Octopharma, we're really proud to support the IDF and uh, their continuing mission with you all as patients, the, really the most important part of everything we do. I'm looking forward to talking to everybody in, in the breakout rooms afterwards and answering any questions that you have and uh, going over some of our programs as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Okay, so at this time, we're going to go ahead and start a Q&A. We have received a lot of questions from our audience. That is so great. Please keep them going. We only have about 20 minutes for our Q&A session, so we are going to try to go through this as quickly as possible. But again, keep sending in those questions. So our first question for you, Dr. Wasserman, uh, can you give us a percentage of how many patients get IV versus the percentage, percentage that get sub-Q? In our practice, uh, about 60% um, get sub-Q and 40% get IV. Um, there are, but that really varies a lot around the country. There are some immunologists who don't do sub-Q at all and others who no longer do IV at all. So uh, there are all different possibilities. Okay. And what is the max IgG dosage uh, that someone should have when taking therapy? The right dose for a person is the dose that keeps them well. Almost everybody is able to do well with a dose less than 800 milligram per kilogram per month. I have a few patients who uh, do better on 1,000 or 1,200 milligram per kilogram per month uh, than they do on 800, but those are really outliers. 
And uh, it's important when you're getting up to those high doses to be sure that all of the other causes of infection uh, are, uh, are addressed uh, because they seldom need to use uh, much more than 800 per kilo per month. Okay. It has been recommended uh, that my three-year-old child have infusions subcutaneously every two weeks. What would be the reason for every two weeks versus weekly? Convenience. Uh, convenience and the number of needle sticks. So the, the um, amount of uh, immunoglobulin delivered uh, every two weeks is double that which is given weekly. And in the studies where levels are measured, um, the levels are almost as high with uh, every other week as they are with weekly. And I think your immunologist is just trying to be sensitive to the burdens on your family and do things less often. Okay. Um, so a patient asked, can sub-Q be done at a hospital or medical facility with a nurse or does it have to be done at home? It depends. Uh, so um, from an FDA point of view, sub-Q products are not licensed for administration by a healthcare professional. They're intended for self-administration. Um, the facilitated subcutaneous uh, product is uh, in its package insert um, permitted to be given by either a healthcare professional or uh, self-administered. Um, whether an individual person can have their sub-Q done by uh, a nurse <clears throat> at an infusion center or having a nurse come to the home to do that uh, is something that would have to be worked through with the provider and the insurance company, um, but it's possible that it may not be permitted. Um, we did have quite a few step Q questions. Here's another one. Um, when um, regarding step Q, does decreasing the number of needle sites result in an increase of the number of times it takes to absorb the medication? No. The more the more sites you use and the more needle sticks you use, the less material you put into an individual site. So the things that you can do. Uh, is are to uh, drink plenty of fluids uh, the morning before you start. Uh, an adult should aim for a quart of water uh, before they start their infusion if there are any side effect problems. Um, you could give the treatment more frequently because the more frequent you give it, the lower the dose per treatment, and you can slow the rate. Uh, you can also use medications before and after. So there are oftentimes people who get headaches from their IVIG will get them at a specified time. Uh, they do their infusion on Monday and every Wednesday at noon they get a headache. Uh, well, in that situation, I'll have the patient uh, to give ibuprofen when they wake up first thing on Wednesday morning and take it on a schedule three times a day for two days or whatever it takes to um, be able to uh, suppress the headache. So there are a variety of manipulations that are available and this is really the art of medicine because nobody's ever really studied side effects and how to manage them. So there's not like there's a lot of data on uh, what to do. It's really experience. Um, okay, now this is one I think that's a bit more aimed um, uh, from uh, parents of children, but I'm sure it, it works for all ages. Um, in terms of new patients or even existing patients who are needle phobic, um, how do you counsel, because both of these modalities as well as the facilitated ultimately do require needles, um, within your practice, how do you counsel patients? How do you uh, mitigate that? How do you help people to deal with that if that might be a barrier to them 
staying on therapy or the way that you want? So that's really an age related kind of thing. Uh, So in people old enough to be reasoned with, um, say five or six or older, uh, and we've had teenagers who are very needlephobic, not too many adults, but it can happen. And there are a variety of uh, approaches to minimize the discomfort of the needle. You can use a topical anesthetic patch before the needle is placed. Um, there's a really interesting device called the Buzzy, B-U-Z-Z-Y, that vibrates in the area. And when there are vibrations in the area, it changes the way your nerve perception works and you don't feel the stick. Uh, So that's another device I've had uh, for small children. um, I've had uh, parents who will put the um, anesthetic patch on and um, do the infusion after the child falls asleep. Uh, You can also um, incorporate the family and make it a treat. So the two boys that I was referring to earlier, they do their sub-Q infusions on treat night. So treat night is a pizza and a movie. Uh, And that's not every night that they get pizza and a movie, but that's part of their ritual for doing their sub-Q immunoglobulin. So it's just a matter of <clears throat> of working through those uh, kinds of issues. But you can usually take away virtually all of the discomfort with a topical anesthetic or the buzzy or both. Uh, very good. And uh, yeah, I was not trying to be a uh, shill for buzzy, but I, I happen to have one in my box uh, uh, that I was just using there. And uh, John, we have time for uh, one last question. And, Got it. Well, then, uh, uh, th- then I'll make it topical uh, to uh, the times that we're in. Uh, given uh, all the changes that folks have had to uh, make in their lives uh, with COVID, uh, have within your practice or have you seen um, routes or frequency changes Uh, basically because of COVID, uh, specifically for college students, again, who are kind of moving back and forth, or anyone else uh, that might have some sort of, if you will, change uh, to their routine and their life. So COVID and infusions, any changes that uh, you have seen, experienced, et cetera? Yeah, so in our practice, we really haven't seen that at all. We have been educating people about the different options for a long time and encouraging sub-Q. And I think it's fair to say that everybody in our practice who's willing to think about sub-Q is already doing it. And we've made provisions for those people who come to the office for their infusions to minimize contact with uh, staff and other patients and permit social distancing. And uh, so we really cut the number of patients in the office at any one time. And I think people have been pretty comfortable uh, coming. Um, I have heard those issues uh, from other people, but we haven't experienced them. All right, well, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for uh, all your questions. Uh, We encourage you to continue uh, to ask questions. Uh, We didn't get to your question, and you can send your question along with your email. Uh, We will make sure that uh, you receive an answer uh, as soon as possible. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Wasserman. Uh, uh, That was a wonderful uh, presentation, and thank you for your time. I know how valuable uh, it is at uh, at this point in time. Uh, And uh, we would like to now uh, call on uh, Sean McCabe uh, from Takeda. Uh, for a quick word uh, from our sponsor. All right, thank you. Just hitting on mute there. Um, wow, another another tough one to follow. I, I wish we were called Baxter because this looks alphabetical. So we've been following all these great presentations after all these uh, with, the, with the name Takeda now. Uh, our lineage is Baxter uh, and then to Baxalta, Shire now Takeda. And if you don't know our manu- us by the manufacturing name, we are the proud manufacturers of Hycuvia, Cuvitru, and Gamma Guard. Um, 
So I'll said, you know, as much as tonight's forum is about products, uh, Dr. Wasserman did a great job also referencing the services that surround these uh, very critical therapies. Uh, so we're looking forward in our breakouts. I'll be joined by my colleague and peer, Dana Flathammer, who leads our PI community support team uh, and my IG source. So uh, I just thank the IDF. Again, I'll echo all the comments from uh, my peers in the industry around the phenomenal job the uh, foundation has done standing up in the moment and conducting these forums in this manner. And uh, a sincere thanks, Dr. Wasserman. It's great to see you um, for your uh, continued stewardship and guidance, not only to the patient community, but also to the HCP. So appreciate your leadership throughout and uh, looking forward to seeing everyone in the breakout. Many thanks. Thank you, Sean. And um, um, we'll be heading into our virtual exhibit hall. And uh, before I would like to share some information as to some of the programs that uh, and some of uh, what we offer uh, on our website. Uh, so you can connect with us online, uh, uh, visit uh, our resources page. Uh, you'll see everything we have to offer. We have publications, uh, we have online support groups. Uh, there's the updates on upcoming events and upcoming forums uh, and, and a lot more uh, that you know, will be helpful uh, in getting information to you uh, timely. Uh, there's uh, a lot going on. Uh, uh, we, can, we will continue to provide uh, forums. We are close to uh, having at times, you know, even two forums a week, uh, providing, you know, topics that uh, will definitely contribute, you know, to increasing your, you know, knowledge and uh, experience with IDF. Uh, so I want to thank all our sponsors uh, uh, one more time. And we are ready uh, to head into our exhibit hall. I'm going to call on our CEO and president, uh, John Boyle, uh, to uh, say our, you know, last words. Okay, the, the last words are uh, that uh, <laughs> nothing ever quite goes the way that one expects, especially uh, when we are, uh, again, moving through these strange times. Right before this call, I was uh, on uh, a Zoom uh, with a colleague in Australia, and my gosh, I mean, Zoom works 99.9% .9 of the time. But of course, as I'm trying to make a transcontinental uh, connection there, that's when all of a sudden, uh, you know, things go kind of wonky. So uh, anyway, the uh, uh, this is the information that you got from Dr. Wasserman and from each other through your questions, um, I think is so incredibly valuable. Uh, I wanted, uh, did want to echo uh, one thing that Dr. Wasserman was talking about with the shared decision-making uh, uh, point. Uh, there are a number of different ways that you can uh, receive immunoglobulin. There is infinite variety, well, not infinite, but there is a significant amount. Um, and if this, some of this is new to you, um, please, Talk with IDF, talk with uh, the, uh, your, your pharmacy, talk with your doctor uh, to make sure that you understand really all of the things that are out there. Because especially if you don't feel like your, um, uh, your infusion situation, if you are on immunoglobulin, is what you want it to be, there is a very good chance that it, it can be optimized. Uh, now, as uh, a couple of us heard in one of our groups, uh, there are some people who have reactions to seemingly everything out there, um, or almost everything. And we've known a lot of people uh, in uh, that, uh, that boat, and sometimes it is an enormous amount of trial and error. And sometimes it's a little bit more knowledge um, about what is, um, uh, what is in there. So again, we can't necessarily give you every uh, piece of information that you're looking for in two hours uh, or in uh, one of our products, but please do engage with us with your physicians, with those that you've met here uh, to help to make sure that you are receiving the standard of care that you think that you should be getting. Um, and if things go wrong, just know uh, that, uh, uh, you know, on the technical side or on the infusion side, I just sprung my first leak in almost three years um, uh, while getting my infusion here on the phone with all of you or on the Zoom. Uh, just know that uh, 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 there is troubleshooting to be done and a whole community of people who are willing to help you uh, along the way. So uh, on behalf of my colleagues, uh, including Ashley, who in fact did lose her power, um, this is how we do it. And we are just thankful that we are in a uh, loving and forgiving community uh, who uh, rolls with the punches. But again, that's what we have to do. We are all zebras. We are all uh, uh, bound together uh, by this strange, strange bond uh, that most people really do not get. Uh, so just know 
we do get it and uh, we are grateful for your patience and we hope that uh, this evening has been um, somewhat of use. So uh, with that, I think that we are done. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wasserman. Thank you all for coming and thanks especially to my colleagues uh, who troubleshoot uh, while, uh, while Zoom and electricity and fire tornadoes uh, abound. So thank you all, have a great night.